Uh, so uh, I once again thank uh, CSPS for giving me this opportunity to interact uh, with the audience on, on my experiences uh, with media text, my engagement with media text, different kinds of media text, obviously newspaper and uh, cartoons, uh, television, and, and more recently on, on the fake news, you know, fact checking website. So uh, I, in today's lecture, I will actually go on, you know, first of all, I'll introduce you what is how do we conduct content analysis of mass media text and then uh, i will you know show you how you know coding is done because uh, the two uh, papers that were sent to me uh, I, I i i found certain things that i need to talk to them so uh, let's see how we proceed on that so i'll be sharing my screen if uh, if there are some issues with that kindly please uh, inform me so uh, as you can see that we are discussing today content analysis of uh, mass media text. So when we talk about mass media text, you know, we have different kinds of mass media text, like it is a, it is a dynamic platform, like right from newspaper text to magazine text, we come across advertisement, we come across television text, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, uh, and, and very recently, you know, new media and, you know, even fact checking websites or, or the social, all the contents that we come across in social networking sites, even WhatsApp text. So there are plenty of text, a plethora of, you know, text that are, that we are surrounded with and, you know, we are being bombarded with information. We as communication scholars actually can identify, you know, you know, some text which are similar in nature and some text which are not similar, but, uh, but for example, the, the, the journalists or, or the new, you know, the cub reporters, uh, for them to uh, a, a bit of knowledge on research, especially communication, uh, content analysis is actually required because they too need to refer to other texts uh, that are available, uh, the, probably referencing other, you know, similar news items or some data, some data, you know, research data on that particular issue. And how do they do a content analysis of those texts that are available to them? So, you know, uh, as Kash, uh, you know, Omer uh, sir has already mentioned that in India, mass communication or rather content analysis or media, you know, text analysis has not been that, you know, uh, you know proper because we see that uh, the methodology, the main problem that lies is in the methodology. Uh, when we send certain articles for publication, we consider that these, uh, what we have done everything from our part. Uh, we uh, take it for granted that whatever we are writing, the, the reviewer will understand. And it is, you know, on the face value, they will understand the methodology that we have adopted without stating exactly what we have done. But they expect every detail to be mentioned in the methodology. So right from, you know, why did we, the justification of choosing a particular text uh, to the process of selecting a particular text, the method of sampling, uh, you know, the justification of particular sampling technique, and even, you know, how do we go for coding and other aspects. So first, let me just, uh, you know, tell, you know, what is uh, content analysis or why, you know, how are we concentrating on content analysis? So, or why should we study a particular media text? Why is it important? Uh, you know, Luendorf uh, describes content analysis as a primary message-centered methodology. So here, that means we are not going to deal with, uh, with individuals, with subjects, you know, people. We are rather going to do a DEX research. That means we are going to do, a, we are going to study certain text that can be visual text, that can be an audio text, that can be uh, simple signs and symbols, uh, that can be a written text. So we are particularly dealing with only text. So when we as media scholars uh, study text, we are not going to study novels and storybooks and, and other literature. We are rather going to concentrate only on mass media text. So that, you know, obviously uh, cut down to newspapers, magazines and, uh, and radio, television and other forms of mass media text. Why do we do that? We rather we actually do a content analysis to try to find more information, to try to segregate the information that are there from the prior information. We try to find certain gaps that are left out for us to you know to dig deeper into. We find certain differences. Uh, it can be you know related to geographical differences in a newspaper that we compare uh, with another newspaper published from somewhere else. Uh, on a particular incident. For example, in my, uh, when I was in my uh, master's, I did my dissertation on, and, and uh, I remember that in 2009, 
the the mumbai attack was there so i did a content analysis of the times of india sorry the hindu newspaper uh, online version of the hindu newspaper and i compared it with the coverage given to the mumbai attack on the dawn newspaper so obviously i did not have the opportunity to get a hard copy of the dawn newspaper so i had to uh, select the web uh, you know web version of dawn and web version of the hindu because there should be comparison between two similar kind of text i cannot compare a text that is of a hard copy with an online version so i should always or you know all the media researchers when we are doing content analysis we should compare an orange with an orange an apple with an apple not an orange with an apple so that's why if we are doing a content analysis of a similar text we have to choose a newspaper if we are doing a broadsheet then we have to select another broadsheet to compare and there should be a comparison if uh, if you know suppose we study only a particular newspaper suppose i say that no i will not study any other newspaper i will select only a particular newspaper and i'll study that fine that can be done but that then then it becomes a, a case study a case study it will be a content analysis of a particular you know case i cannot generalize anything out of it it will be a particular and it will be particular to that particular newspaper only or or that particular television show however if i choose a, a, a you know the text for a, a longer duration of time for example for one year two year then a variation can be found and then that can be you know uh, considered as a content analysis we also look for patterns as we look for differences we also uh, you know look for patterns that will come out of the content you know of the text that are repeatedly if there is certain repetition if there is a frequency of appearance of something if there is a you know absence complete absence of something absence of something is also a you know a, a result so it is not that you know uh, for example suppose uh, we do not get much development related news items or or environmental related news items in newspapers it doesn't mean that we should not choose this uh, topic for our study because once we choose a particular topic for example the menstru you know uh, menstruation as a social taboo or or any kind of uh, content on menstruation uh, that gets published in newspapers that can be a very good topic for study and if we find out that for six months i choose a two three newspapers and i compare it and i found that i find that only uh, you know not many uh, news articles or even uh, feature stories are published on that particular topic that is itself my finding but then i have to code it code it and operationalize it in such a manner that any other researcher using my codes in some other newspaper or at a different uh, geographical location if they also apply it they will also have to get similar results otherwise it will be subjective it will not be an objective research so uh, let's see the uh, a bit about the background of content analysis uh, so you know mass communication research is started with you know uh, systematic analysis of media and it cropped from herald de las was you know 1927 studies of the you know the the propaganda related content that was generated by voice of america and other uh, not sorry not voice of america the 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 world war uh, related propaganda uh, machineries so media content analysis became increasingly popular as a research methodology in the past few decades uh, even during the 1920s and 30s for investigating the rapidly expanding communication content of movies you know movies were uh, you know analyzed and then you know obviously uh, for in, in uh, you know newspapers radio programs were analyzed uh, and television programs were also analyzed uh, once television started you know television boom took place uh, after the you know uh, the satellite uh, channels cropped up in india post 19 uh, post 2000s you know there was a boom in content analysis of the soap operas and and if you pick up any content analysis on television you will find the soap opera related content analysis you will find studies of you know stereotypical portrayal or studies on you know uh, gender uh, when there are studies on the portrayal of violence racism uh, women obviously women in television programming and films and and you know stereotypical representation in films uh, like minor representation of minorities representation of sexual minorities so these are some of the some of the core areas of content analysis that we come across uh, you know very often 
But you know, we also do not come across most of the content analysis on uh, left, for example, you know, sexual minorities or trade union. You know, these are some of the these are some of the topics which uh, normally people uh, simply avoid. Or I don't know why, but I have found it very interesting that you know, trade union related stories, uh, domestic workers related stories, or or these issues are not looked upon in content analysis. Uh, content analysis are of two types, you know, we follow either qualitative content analysis or, or quantitative content analysis. So, you know, I, this would be a, a you know, disclaimer that, you know, I basically, uh, you know, get involved in with all the qualitative content analysis because I'm not that, uh, you know, good in statistical analysis and also. Uh, but it's not that, you know, uh, if we do qualitative content analysis, it will be biased because uh, it was uh, uh, of, it was an opinion among the you know, Western researchers to that qualitative content analysis suffers from biases of the researcher or they are not objective. Sometimes they are also not, uh, you know, generalized. They, are, uh, the, they suffer from generalization. But if we, uh, but there, you know, there are also, you know, way out because once we conduct a qualitative content analysis, we have to strictly follow the strategy, the, the rules, the strictly follow the procedure. We have to maintain everything, you know, we have to maintain the methodology very properly, and we have to justify each and every decision that we take. Um, once again, you know, these definitions, uh, you know, Pippendorf defined content analysis as a research technique for making replicable and valid inferences from data to their context. That means we cannot study a data you know, uh, in a secluded or in vacuum, we have to study any data in the context. So, and, you know, uh, even Berelson also said that content analysis is a research technique for objective, systematic and quantitative description. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, now we also come across many other qualitative content analysis also, uh, and they do in order to make them more generalized, you know, uh, acceptable some aspects of quantitative techniques are also used. Uh, for example, you know, certain, you know, uh, you know how, how much, you know, the, the data that is collected, like the, the amount of content that is being analyzed, how is that content being selected? That should be objectively defined. All these definitions should be there. Now, there are three basic approaches of content analysis, and that should be followed religiously. First is objectivity which means that analysis is you know, pursued on the basis of explicit rules. There are certain rules that should be maintained, uh, which enables the researcher to not lose focus and to find obtain the same results from the same documents over and over again. For example, if I do a content analysis with a particular you know, operational definitions and codes, and if I do conduct the same research after a few years, I should get with the same content, I should get the same result. It should be systematic. The inclusion and exclusion of the content should be done according to some consistency. That means we should refer to certain rules, certain, you know, uh, we should refer to certain, uh, you know, published text. We should refer to other literatures that have already codified certain, you know, uh, data. So if we refer to them and then because we cannot simply, uh, you know, simply uh, code, uh, you know, on our own, even if we code something, uh, you know, we have to properly justify so that the same code should be applied in other researches also. Obviously, generalizability should be there. The results obtained by a researcher through a content analysis can be applied to similar situations at other uh, other geographical areas or other you know other uh, research field also. So, for example, if I study the stereotypical representation of female in a particular soap opera and I use a particular codes, and if uh, Makshinder also uses the similar codes in another, uh, you know, in uh, for in an analysis of a film. Similar results should be, you know, the, he should also receive similar results. So that is how content analysis should be done. The course should be, and the procedure should be maintained in such a way that the results will be same in all the cases. So that's why what we do is we basically take references of the codes that are already established. And sometimes we also uh, generate our own codes and in a manner that this, this should also be applied by other researchers in future. The objective of content analysis is to, you know, uh, that it, it should specify the statement, uh, you know, we, in be, you know, before starting any research, we should be very clear with our objectives and research questions, uh, you know, and, and hypothesis. Like uh, if, if there are research questions that should be answered at the end of the research, that means we cannot deviate from those research questions. 
for example, whatever we want to find out from the research, that should be very clear, uh, you know, um, from in the from the beginning of that content analysis. Because once we start a content analysis, we will find that there are so many, you know, uh, you know, phenomena are cropping up, and we 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 might get uh, disoriented, or we might get attracted by everything, and we might want to adopt and you know, in uh, and you know, uh, have everything in, under our research. But that cannot be done. That will what will happen? We cannot delimit ourselves. So what uh, we should do is once we do a content analysis, we should follow the research question and be focused. And even even if we find certain codes that are cropping up. Up and that should be included but if it doesn't fit with the research question it is better to avoid that however they can be included in the research gap and it can be you know research further in a, in another research uh, in, in another study uh, the researcher who wishes to undertake a study using content analysis must deal with four methodological issues first the selection of the unit of analysis because in a content, there are several that the unit of analysis can be a scene of a television program or a film. It can be a shot of a television, uh, you know, uh, program. If we are talking about newspaper content, it can be a new story. The unit of analysis can be a complete new story. It can be a paragraph. It can be a sentence. It can be the headline. It might be only a word. So it completely depends on selection of a particular unit of analysis and we cannot change it over time. So that should be stagnant. Developing categories. We have to, once we start the research, we have to develop certain categories. And that is also, that happens in due course of time. We have to take sampling, you know, the sampling technique should be very proper. Now, you know, we might uh, come across, you know, certain uh, researchers using, even I have also used purposive sampling technique. Now, once we use purposively, you know, we purposively select a particular sample, that should be representative. It's, it's not that, you know, we have a whole lot of uh, universe and I purposely select only those samples that I am, you know, that are convenient for me. Because in that uh, process, what will happen, I will not be, be ethical in my research work. I'll, I'll be biased from the beginning itself. So selection of a particular sample should be very proper. If we are doing a probability sampling, then we should follow probability sampling. However, there are you know, various other techniques, like there are multi-stage sampling, there are stratified sampling that also are adopted in you know, uh, content analysis. For example, suppose we do a content analysis of newspaper. Like I have seen both the uh, scholars who are doing content analysis of newspaper. So if we uh, select a particular, uh, you know, if we select systematic sampling, that means, uh, you know, I will be unbiasedly, I'll be selecting a particular newspaper or, or, or particular edition or, you know, uh, twice a week or once in a week, I will select a particular day, like every Wednesday, I'll select the Wednesday's edition or you know, the every op-ed page of Wednesday's edition. So that should be clearly mentioned or clearly you know, identified at the very beginning so that you know, there are no questions of objectivity. Uh, then checking reliability and coding is another further step that should be maintained and religiously as I mentioned, because, because you know, once we say, like, do content analysis, there is every possibility that we might get bias. So for, to avoid the biasness of the researcher, the researcher should be reflexive every time, right from the choosing of unit of analysis to developing the categories to you know selecting the samples. In fact, even to coding, the researcher should be reflexive. Is he or she deviating? Is he or she getting biased? So how do we check that? What we do is we do intercoder reliability, and I will discuss that in in the later slides. Uh, we have to do coding, you know, and there are, you know, there can be two coding or even one, the single researcher, they themselves can do multiple coding, like I can myself do repeatedly coding, so that, you know, uh, I, I, so that I find that even if I do repeatedly, uh, I code repeatedly, the same result crops up every time. Or what we can do is we can, you know, uh, use a friend or a colleague or even a junior and, you know, give them a code book uh, with the rules that, you know, this word will mean this. So if you find uh, this description there, then code it as uh, stereotypical. If you, fi if you find that, you know, a person is not or, or uh, an, an elderly person is not uh, shown in this, uh, in this scene, in the scene of any movie for 10 minutes, that means the person is under, that means elderly person is underrepresented and that should be coded. And so once the recorder follows this definition every time and should count and, you know, they should be, you know, they should take a tab, they keep a tab that they are following it. 
So even if somebody else does it after five years so with the same code, they will also have the similar result. So this is how we keep checks and balances while doing coding and content analysis. Uh, now I will, you know, give you a few examples of, you know, how do we do content analysis of, you know, for example, films. Uh, this is a very recent, uh, recent study by one of my students. Uh, she was doing a portrayal of a psychologist or psychiatrist in films, in, especially in Hindi films. So uh, in the last, I think she took a period of 10 years, all the films that were released in the 10 years. So obviously she should not, uh, as I suggested that she should not pick and choose the films, uh, you know, purposively, because again, that will be a biased selection. So what she had to do, she had to list out all the names of films that uh, got released in during that particular period of 10 years. And then out of those, she did a lottery method. Obviously she got, I think 16 to 17 films. And out of that, those 16 to 17 films, she did a lottery method. That means she completely, there was no, uh, you know, researchers bias in picking that particular film. That means those particular films, those were which, which got selected had equal chances of getting selected. This is the rule of a probability method that every, uh, you know, sample will have an equal chance of getting selected. Either you do a lottery or you do a tossing or you simply, you know, uh, write down and, and, and close your eyes and just uh, put a finger on it. You do whatever you want, but this is a, a probability sampling, you know, random sampling method that is known uh, so that was followed by her. So the first stage of selection of sampling was uh, covered. Next, you know, she had to, you know, she had certain research questions and then she went on to code. Uh, at the scene level, the movies chosen will be valid. This is where her objective uh, will be evaluated thoroughly to find out the number of times a positive or negative portrayal was demonstrated on screen of the psychologist or psychiatrist. And if there was a proper treatment shown, which gave a sign of recovery or if there was an absence of treatment. So uh, she tried to find out if they, how were the psych psychiatrist uh, you know, represented? Were they shown as you know, uh, you know, uh, Akshay Kumar treating uh, Vidya Balan in Bhul Bhulaiya? Or were they shown you know, uh, a, a series of tests and, and diagnosis being done in a hospital? So this is how she tried to code. And there were uh, certain coding, you know, operational definitions also for coding. Uh, this analysis also tried to find out whether the role of the psychiatrist in the films was portrayed to be misrepresented, were underrepresented or neutral. Again, here you will see that these terms misrepresented was defined, you know, operationally defined. So she had to define what, you know, what did she mean by the term misrepresented? So she had to say, you know, uh, that using of, uh, using of uh, technique, uh, non-medical tools and techniques and using of uh, uh, living uh, to God's mercy and also all these things she had to define. And she took references from some of the medical journals. So she took references and she cited certain medical journals, you know, which also did similar studies on representation of doctors. And underrepresented was also done in the similar fashion. Neutral was also codified in the similar fashion. Uh, and when, uh, suppose uh, we do a research on newspapers, so what do we do? We either do comparative analysis of editorials. Uh, this is again another uh, topic that I uh, was, uh, you know, doing. So it was in there. I wanted to do a comparative analysis of editorials. Uh, editorials means all the you know news uh, content and not the op-ed page. Okay, so the editorials about farmers' protest uh, during uh, farmers' protest in the, and during the you know uh, first I think first January to 30th January. That was the period I chose for that for you know selection of uh, doing a content analysis of a, of a one month uh, coverage of newspapers. I think I took Times of India and Hindustan Times. So these two newspapers were chosen. And I uh, wanted to see how were they representing the farmers' protest. So in this study, you know, again, one can see are the topics uh, and another another topic of study can be menstruation or mental health. How are they covered in national English uh, newspaper? And how again, since we have to compare, so what we can do is we can select uh, one national uh, English language newspaper and we can select any vernacular language newspaper. You know that is equally you know uh, popular. So and then we can compare if uh, this these topics of menstruation or mental health are covered 
uh, you know, how what they covered in these two dailies, okay? And we can select a period of time. It can be two months or three months. And again, how we select those uh, particular editions uh, or, or the particular publication that also has to have, this has to follow a particular sampling technique. You know, we have to choose the unit of analysis again, following a particular sampling technique. And then we go on doing the coding also. Now we see how we, once we select the samples, then what? You know, once we have decided on the topic, we selected the sample and we, you know, uh, chose the period of study. Now what? Now we have to select the, you know, uh, we have to select the concept and categories that we are going to study. Because we cannot go on studying all the articles, isn't it? We cannot go on studying all the articles or all the, all the you know, uh, uh, scenes of a particular, uh, you know, uh, serial or a film. We cannot study all the scenes. Because if we are studying two or three films, studying all the scenes means that, that much of time. Because one scene consists of, you know, a whole lot of minutes and seconds. And, and we have to, if we are doing a quantitative analysis, we have to, uh, you know, keep a tab on every second that is counting. And even there are other other things also involved. Sometimes semiotic analysis is also done. You know what is placed in the background of the character, what is placed at the foreground of the character, uh, how are the characters positioned? If somebody is standing, if somebody is sitting, you know, uh, if somebody is looking at the camera and talking, if somebody is not getting the talking time. So all these are also units of analysis. The con a concept is chosen for examination and analysis involves quantifying and counting is present. That means. How far, how many times are, you know, something is present, like the frequency of appearance or the absence. Uh, you know, here we try to explicit certain terms, uh, you know, through coding. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, the reliability test is done uh, uh, for validity of those codes. For example, if I code something on my own, and if I do not test the reliability and validity, then again, how do I, uh, how do I justify that the codes that I found are the codes that I wanted to find? Because it, it might happen that, you know, I, and very recently I did a study on cartoons, uh, cartoon shows. And, you know, it's not that I watch those cartoon shows for only for the period of my study. I have been watching these cartoon shows for, I think, more than four and a half years. Uh, we, uh, and, and that means I have, I have by hearted every show. That means I have bought it by hearted, you know, all the uh, scenes and shots and everything. But still, well, while doing the research, I had to code it. I had to codify it and I had to do an intercoded reliability because what I was seeing is, was it so that another person who was not from a mass communication background, who was not you know, so much into watching cartoon shows also would see the same thing that I, I, I noticed? That is also a factor. So for that, we have to do an intercoded reliability test. So, you know, how do we proceed with the research? First, we, you know, uh, formulate certain research questions that will guide our, you know, selection of communication uh, of the content. And then we select the sample. Again, we have to follow certain procedures of sampling techniques. Uh, you know, either we do a probability sampling technique or a non-probability sampling technique. Even if we are doing a non-probability sampling technique, like a convenience sampling or purposive sampling, we should justify. Like I, I simply stated that when I was doing the content analysis of the cartoon show, and I was studying the gender, you know, I was studying the, uh, the representation of gender, how, uh, you know, how this particular cartoon show was gender neutral compared to other cartoon shows, okay? It was not that stereotypical, you know, stereotypical in nature. But while choosing that particular show, I knew that I am doing a research on that particular show. show but then while, since I'm doing a you know, content analysis, I have to have a sample. So what I did while choosing, and, I'm, and I was choosing a purposive, you know, I was choosing particular episodes purposively out of all the seasons that that, uh, that cartoon show had. So what I did is I justified that those particular episodes I chose only because in the YouTube channel of that particular cartoon show, during the Women's Day, uh, you know, uh, as a Women's Day, uh, you know, show, they uploaded those particular four cartoon shows. Okay, so the uh, the four particular cartoon shows were released on Women's Day, so that became one of my justification because the producers themselves selected those particular four episodes as you know as as and they were showing that these are you know uh, to mark Women's Day, International Women's Day. So I tried to find out what are the things. Uh, that are there in that in those episodes that can uh, you know that can actually show them as gender neutral or or uh, as a women being empowered okay so this is how we have to justify 
uh, again, we have, you know, when we study the card again now, further, what do we do? Once we select the sample, we have to again set certain categories. And for setting categories, first of all, we have to, uh, you know, okay, we have to go into the meaning unit. Now, as I mentioned, unit of analysis. When we have a unit of analysis, the unit of analysis can be a particular scene, it can be a whole episode. For a newspaper, it can be a particular news item. It can be only a paragraph of the news item. It can be the headlines of all the news item. It can be only the photographs of, uh, uh, you know, only the photographs and its captions. So all these form unit of analysis. Now it's up to the, uh, you know, it is up to the researcher and on the topic and research question that they have to decide and select and justify properly why are they choosing this particular unit of analysis and is it. It, is it in line with their, uh, it is, is it aligned with their research question? If not, then they should rethink and choose again. So this meaning, meaning unit, you know, first uh, it can be a sentence as I mentioned, but we cannot go on, you know, analyzing all these sentences. So what do we do? Once we analyze a particular sentence, we have to condense and compress it to a more meaningful, smaller version. Okay, but because we will have a lot of, uh, you know, meaning units. It's not that I'm, if I'm doing a one month uh, newspaper study, I'll have, you know, uh, 100 meaning units. I might have 1000 meaning units and those might be a paragraph long. So what I do is uh, once I select a meaning unit, I have to compress it into condensed unit, which can be a, a simple explanation of the particular paragraph or the particular news story. If it is a whole news story, anti-farmer protest a new story. What I do is I simply jot down the important points, the keywords of from that particular news items and make it as a condensed unit. Now, once I decide on the condensed unit, I then further go into coding, coding that condensed unit in as labels, okay? So codes are uh, of the, you know, codes are basically labels or markers, okay? And what we, why do we use it to make it more simplified? So that it can be used by other researchers also, and so that it can be, we can also refer to other, uh, you know, literature uh, to find out if these similar codes were also applied there. So and that's why we make certain levels and markers for that condensed unit. So once we find out the codes, now what we do? Once we get the codes, and then we do an intercodal reliability test. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, and now it's, uh, you know, it's better that we should do a pilot study for intercoded reliability because obviously it is not possible for you also to do a research, uh, you know, code the whole data. And if you expect that your friend will also go through the, all the content, all the newspapers of your study, you know, the sample, it is absolutely impossible. So what you do is you, again, you use a sampling technique to pick a particular section of the news, uh, you know, uh, newspapers or television uh, program and you do the coding. Okay, so the, that means it is a sample of the sample. Okay, so it is sampling of the sample and then you do the coding out of it. Once you do the coding, you do the intercoder reliability test, you know, it, there can be percent agreement test. You know, this is a, the, the, the simplest form of intercoder reliability. That means percent agreement. You know, you find a percentage of agreement of both the coders. If you, there are two coders and on, you know, what were the total number of codes that were coded and on how many codes they, uh, you know, agreed upon. So this is the percent agreement that you do. This is the basic basic unit, the uh, basic, uh, you know, uh, formula that is applied. There are also other, you know, high-end uh, coding uh, tests that are like Flies Kepar there, Cohen Kepar there. So, you know, they are statistically used. So if, if you are, uh, if you are, you know, uh, if you're able to do that, then it is well and fine. But if not, then at least a percent agreement will also do. So once you do a coding of the sample of the larger sample, what you do is you find the categories, you know, so what you, uh, you categorize those all the codes. For example, you will find a multiple codes stating masculine or, or stating anti-protest. Okay, now anti-protest uh, or, or anti-farmers, again, anti-protest will be there, anti-farmers also will be there. So these will be the two codes. Now these two codes can be combined together as a category. Again, there can be a neutral, there can be, you know, uh, you know something which was um, unclear. So they can also be combined into a separate code. So similar in similar fashion, when we study, uh, you know, uh, the gender representation or, or representation of the minorities, we again do how, you know, stereotypically they are represented, how, you know, racial markers are presented. So these again, stereotypes can be categorized with several codes together. 
okay if they are using certain you know markers like you know religious markers are used certain you know if if uh, for you know stereotypically representing a bengali usage of rasagullas are there usage of uh, dhoti kurta is there usage of uh, hilsa fish is there so these are the codes that we find out and we categorize it as stereotypical representation of bengali okay similarly if we want to find out stereotypical representation of a muslim what are the codes if the if the character living uh, if the character shown in that particular soap opera or film lives in a ghettoized uh, you know location lives uh, you know uh, uh, you know uses the marker that are like uh, uses a skull cap or or uh, burqa if she if she she is burqa clad uh, so all these if we find these will be codes and then we can categorize it as stereotypical representation of a minority community out of all these categories then we go into a broader theme which is you know abstraction so we cannot simply analyze everything only based on categories as i told you first we find a meaning unit then we condense them into more simplified version and then we label them as markers as codes we do the intercodal reliability test and then based on the codes we collect the codes we segregate them into different categories the categories then make up themes you know themes of oppression themes of otherization uh, or or themes of you know subjugation in terms of gender uh, gender you know uh, gender representation uh if we are doing a study on newspaper similarly the photographs how are the photographs you know the the visuals used in the photographs is the is it a high angle shot or is it a low angle shot and then again in your question definition you have to explain what does a high angle shot mean and you can refer to other published resources for explaining that so once the abstraction and themes are generated you can uh, you know uh, you know go on into you know taking contextual references and social other theoretical references and explain the phenomena now once we do operationalization of concepts uh, as i mentioned you know when we were doing coding we have to decide how we distinguish among concepts so the first step is a pilot study as i mentioned you know uh, you know we cannot while doing coding we cannot simply do the coding of all the the whole samples so what we do is we pick up a particular section of the sample and then we operationalize them uh, we we write down the rules for coding and those that code book can be given to the other coder uh, on even if you are not doing the coding yourself you can give with two other you know two different coders for coding uh, to be uh, completely unbiased and they will find out if those codes are uh, you know are co cropping up from your content and then you can simply study the intercoder reliability to find out if the codes are actually there if if you if whatever you are seeing is actually being seen by everybody uh for example you know uh, there are again certain codes which look similar but are not same for example male is a different code and masculine is a different code so you can again operationally define what is a male okay and what is a masculine so for the coder that will become easier and not just for the coder the same codes might be used by another researcher in future too so they will cite you they will refer you while i when i do such research i refer to other research work that were published earlier like how did they define masculine by masculine what does what do they mean and there are actually set certain set guidelines you know there are i think 20 or 40 uh, norms uh, to say how you know what is masculine or what is a feminine nature or what is under representation what is representation so i just simply have to uh, follow those codes okay the manual if i do not suppose i am doing certain research where i do not get the similar codes anywhere so there i can obviously generate my own codes uh, in a fashion that you know these codes can be applied by the future researchers these rules could make all of these word segments fall into the same category or perhaps the rules can be formulated uh, so that the researcher can distinguish these word segments into separate codes so this uh, all the explanation should be there uh, you know uh, the, you know of the particular code so that the researcher while coding it becomes easier for the researcher and obviously this code should be ex you know mutually ex exclusive like you know if if uh, if they they should not feel that this is masculine also and feminine also that means for that particular particular representation there should be a different uh, explanation that should be coded differently when there is a gender fluidity okay so that means that that should be coded as gender fluid that should not be coded as masculine and feminine which i actually found in my study 
So uh, as I mentioned already that we have to develop the rules for coding of a particular text. Uh, this will keep the coding process organized and consistent. Uh, validity of the coding process is ensured so that you know no biasness of the researcher crops up. Uh, the researcher, you know, so that it helps the researcher to remain consistent in the whole process of the research. And the same code should be, you know, uh, available because once the research is published, it becomes, uh, you know, it becomes helpful for other further future researchers also to refer and uh, develop their own study. Uh, so when, uh, you know, while coding the text, now how do we code the text? Now there are obviously computer aided coding also are there and there are manual coding too. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not too, you know, conversant in quantitative, uh, you know, analysis and also I, what I have been doing, I have been doing manual coding, uh, but you know, computer aided codings are also there. Uh, which uh, what we do is, what I do is, you know, I basically use Excel sheet and there I put, uh, you know, I, uh, I I already define all the codes that I have mentioned, and then I try to find out if those codes are appearing. So if there is a presence of a code, it will be a one, it will be denoted by one. If there is an absence of a code, it will be denoted by zero. That is how I do. And my, and the other coder will also do the similar, in a similar fashion. I will just show you one of the, uh, you know, code sheet. Uh, this decision of hand versus computer coding is, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, is up to the researcher. Uh, it's, it's, it's not that, you know, uh, if you do a hand manual coding, it is wrong, or if you do a computer aided coding, that will be much uh, easier or much, you know, acceptable. It completely depends upon the researcher, his his or her way of handling the thing. Obviously, computer aided, uh, you know, coding helps in simplifying and, you know, uh, uh, getting your things done, you know, in a much more faster manner. But obviously, once you do manually you as a human being you tend to look into or you tend to find out many things which the machine might overlook so uh, you know although even if you do a computer aided coding i would suggest that uh, you know uh, post that you should also do a manual coding okay so in order to find out certain you know certain things which might be left out from the analysis this is a coding example that I am showing. You know the uh, the topic that I say, I mentioned earlier when I was doing a study on uh, the the farmers' protest. How was it covered by the Telegraph and Time, uh, Hindustan Times? Okay, so I and and I the format that I choose. See, this is how you have to design a. Uh, an Excel sheet where you will code. So what you do is these are the you know the samples. My you know what I chose the two newspapers for a period of one month and see you will see that consistently i am choosing a particular date okay so that means uh, every every day since i was doing a one month study that means you know i chose only four week okay so a particular date i chose that every that particular day of that week so i think i forgot i think it was a tuesday or some wednesday so that if i was choosing one wednesday next 11 would also be another wednesday so i had nothing uh, to do in choosing that particular newspaper so once i chose that particular newspaper using a systematic sampling technique i got the units of analysis now these are the codes that i set uh, you know, I was studying basically the salience of uh, salience of that item. Now, like how you know how important the newspaper considers that particular item. Uh, if if they consider a particular news item on farmers' protest important, so how would I know that if if uh, they are considering it important uh, while publishing? So what do I do? This uh, salience again uh, is if uh, you know I refer to other earlier research work and early, earlier publication, and I found that the explanation of salience is front page placement above the fold placement, and non salience is below the fold placement and snippets column. Okay, so these are the four you know explanation of a salience and non salience. So what I did is I simply chose the codes, I put them down, and this is this comes under the category of uh, you know, salience and non salience. So this must be salience and this must be non salience. So what uh, under the salience front page above the fold and non salience is below the fold or snippets. That means not so important. So and then uh, I, I chose uh, since it was only done by me and that's why I will not be able to show you the other coders uh, sheet. So since I did it myself. So when I was finding uh, the salience, uh, so I, I was giving it the presence. I was marking it as one, one, one. Okay. When I did not find it was an absent, it was not above the fold. So I marked it as zero. When I completed my code for suppose 
today if uh, you know someone of you you pick up the same newspapers pick up you know take the same course and do the study uh, and if you come up with different code like if you do not match with my code then what we have to do we have to find a agreement percent agreement and if we see that our percent agreement is below 50% that means my coding doesn't work then i have to have alternate coding okay so this is how we do coding so if uh, so that's why that should be done as a pilot study before starting the research uh, in conclusion you know i will say that content analysis is a very useful research technique because you know uh, obviously there are you know other research techniques like semiotic analysis is there critical discourse analysis is there a uh, content analysis is a very you know very simplified version and once we do a macro or meso study then we go on into doing critical discourse analysis also content analysis uh, you know till uh, to, you know uh, till i think uh, 10 years back it was only considered to be quantitative content analysis but in the last uh, 10 you know last one decade uh, you know researchers and you know uh, are are accepting qualitative content analysis also but the only fact is that while even if you are doing qualitative content analysis you have to be very systematic you have to be just you have to justify each of your decision uh and follow the rules you know you just you cannot in order to be reflexive and in order to uh, you know keep away from biases uh it offers objective guidelines uh, you know in coding the text and to draw inferences from the data uh, qualitative content analysis although depends on thematic analysis of course orienting coders checking the intercoder reliability is you know training the coders giving them the manual checking the manual thoroughly again and again uh, you know referring to the code books already the which are available in the you know you know open source or there are books certain books on coding so you know and only then selecting a particular statistical design for testing like uh, once if we have hypothesis for the the paper that uh, dr riaz was mentioning we did a content analysis of the fact checking websites to see which were the fake news that were fact checked by the more fact check or or you know fact checked by uh, two fact checking websites the boom live and uh, alt news and we you know we found a certain uh, you know uh you know we came across certain findings there what we did since that was an out and out quantitative content analysis because because we were searching the frequency of appearance how many you know how we were uh, seeing how what was the quantity of of uh, you know fact checking of a particular kind of news item so we did a you know uh, we had hypothesis and we had to do a hypothesis test so the basic hypothesis test we depended on uh, t test uh, that was also done that was also uh, done using excel okay so that also can be done but it is not that you know only using quantitative content analysis is you know acceptable while qualitative content analysis also gives a very you know a uh, very good uh, you know research findings and which if someone wants can be further you know uh, further uh, reverified or analyzed or generalized using more quantitative uh, techniques okay or can be a, a quantitative tool also can be applied to the same research topic so uh, these are the references that i have used you know these are the uh, books that you can also refer to understand more on quanti or qualitative content analysis or quantitative content analysis uh, so thank you so much dr lashkar uh, it was indeed i myself learned a lot so i'm sure uh, other participants too must have learned thank you so much i think we can end it here uh, i will hand over to dr omar anas yeah thank you very much uh, i should say that i have attended uh, almost complete discussion and it was so uh, engrossing and even uh, uh, she had explained uh, all the methodological detail in a very interesting way and i can see that uh, so much interest uh, among our participants also and uh, i would uh, just say that uh, dr kafia uh, we should uh, hold uh, similar events uh, again and again to train more students and more media research scholars uh, for uh, methodologies so once again thank you very much uh, for you and uh, thank you very much dr riaz uh, for you also for introducing us and introducing to the cspas uh, with such a wonderful scholar so here i would like to uh, stop the the session and uh, once again thank you everyone